Our next sponsor is Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters with great sponsorship opportunities like host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. Podcorn takes out the middleman so podcasters of all levels have a chance to monetize their podcast, setting their own rates and having full control over their collaborations. We started using Podcorn a few months ago and it's already changed the game. We can actually make some money from podcasting which means we can put more time into doing what we love and trying to produce quality content. I found the site so easy to use, podcorn.com. You'll find the link in our show notes. It really is easy to navigate and you can view loads of different sponsorship opportunities right there on your screen. It couldn't be easier to pitch a proposal to a brand to work with them on a campaign. Podcorn makes sure podcasters are able to keep their creative freedom and have full control over how and when we monetize. They also have automated payment, which means you get your money as soon as you've submitted your work. If you're a fellow podcast host, definitely check out their site, podcorn.com. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. I am going for officers now. Welcome to Crime Laps. I'm Eileen. And I am Charlie. Paranoia is defined as a mental condition, characterised by delusions of persecution or grandeur. A paranoid person has an unreasonable fear that people are out to get them. It is an instinct influenced by anxiety that creates a false belief that people are plotting against you. When someone who is extremely dangerous becomes incredibly paranoid, the outcome can be catastrophic. After he was led to believe that his ex-girlfriend was romantically involved with a police officer, Raoul Moat's paranoia manifested, leading him to start hunting police officers. What followed was one of the largest UK manhunts of all time. This is Hunting for Officers. Raoul Moat was born June 17th, 1973. He is from Newcastle-upon-Tyne in Northern England. His mother, Josephine, suffered with mental health problems and he never knew his father. He would dream up a backstory for his father, fantasising about a different family life. His reality was very different. One of his earliest childhood memories is watching his mother burn all of his toys. He went to live with his grandmother a few doors down from his mother and stepfather. He remained trouble as he grew up, committing arson and acts of animal cruelty. He left school when he was 16 and practiced martial arts. He began obsessing over his body, maintaining control on one of the only things he knew he could. He began taking steroids to increase his mass, and with the steroids, some say his already quick temper worsened. Moat began working as a panel beater, then a doorman for a nightclub. He began a relationship with a woman who said he would beat and rape her throughout the nine years they were together. They had two children together. He would plant lies in the children's head to get them to turn away from their mother. He would make false allegations against their mother to obtain custody of the children, but he did not treat them well either. Moat himself began to believe that social services were trying to destroy his family. He would record conversations and imagine there was some great conspiracy against him. In 2004, he met Samantha Stubbett. She was 15 years younger than him, pretty, slim and blonde. His history of domestic assault would repeat itself. They had a turbulent relationship. For six years, the relationship was punctuated by episodes of violence and brief estrangement. In an interview in July 2010, Samantha's family members said that Raoul Moat was all muscles, rippling biceps, six-pack. He towered over Samantha. He controlled her, insisting she wore makeup and never letting her go out without being by his side. He would speak openly about his assaults, almost seeming proud that he never punched her. He did throw her against the wall, jump on her stomach and knee her in the face. He convinced himself that this was okay because she wasn't acting exactly how he wanted and when he calmed down he would apologise and promise her the world and the cycle would begin again, repeating itself over and over. Three years into their relationship they had a child together, a little girl. Moat's warped purest ideas would guarantee his demise. Raoul Moat was a paranoid narcissist. 
he believed that authorities had a vendetta against him. He recorded and documented everything obsessively. He had CCTV installed at his home and would record conversations. He had been arrested 12 times in a 10-year period and only convicted once. This fortified his belief that he was being harassed by the police. He had hours of recordings that he had made in secret, chronicling everything from outings with his children to conversations with the police. He would project blame onto everyone but himself. Always the victim, his actions in his mind, were always forced by someone else's hand. Moat would make up accusations against the police as if they were trying to provoke him into committing a crime. His deluded victim stance and unstable mental state made him dangerous. He set up a business as a tree surgeon, but after would say in recordings he made that the police were always on his back. A year before Raoul Moat went on a rampage, he was pulled over by BC David Ratband who seized an uninsured vehicle he had been driving. PC Ratband remembered Moat as an angry, angry man who disliked members of the police force. Moat was memorable, both personality-wise and physically. As a former bodybuilder, his stature was striking. He was over six foot tall and 17 stone of muscle. He would later liken himself to the Hulk or King Kong, and he wasn't far off. In early 2010, he assaulted a nine-year-old child, a relative. He received an 18-week sentence in Durham Prison. This was his first and only conviction. He would later say in a 999 call that he went to jail for something he didn't do. He said he went to jail because his barrister promised him he would be able to get a retrial and be found not guilty, allowing him to live with Samantha when he got out. But this never happened. While he was in prison, Samantha told him that their relationship was completely over. She said she was now seeing a younger, stronger man who happened to be a policeman. Instead of this inciting fear in Raoul Moat, it incensed him. Maybe Samantha Stobbert hoped that this would deter Raoul Moat from trying to contact her when he was released from prison. It did not. At approximately 11am on Thursday the 1st of July 2010, Raoul Moat was released from prison after serving 18 weeks for common assault on one of his own children. He then meets with his friends, Carl Ness and Querum Awan. Carl Ness had been spying on Samantha Stobbert while Moat was behind bars. He provided Raoul Moat with a shotgun and they researched Samantha's new boyfriend on the internet and called the local leisure centre to try and find out if he taught karate there. On Friday, July 2nd, he's seen on security footage at a DIY and homeware store in Newcastle. He'd just gotten his hair cut into a Mohican. He had told the barber he had a few things to do and that he predicted he'll be back in prison soon. In the CCTV footage from B&Q, he's wearing a bright orange t-shirt that clings to his massive physique. He's buying camping equipment. He knows he will need it soon. On that same day, information from Durham Prison is passed to Northumbria Police, suggesting Raoul Moat may pose a threat to his ex-girlfriend, Samantha Stubbert. Samantha had been out celebrating her mum's birthday with friends, family and her new boyfriend, Chris Brown. The couple weren't seeing each other long. According to Samantha's later testimony, they met up for drinks as Raoul Moat plagued Samantha with texts and phone calls demanding to know where she was and who she was with. In the early hours of Saturday morning, they went to a neighbour's house for drinks. Raoul Moat was closing in. Carl Ness drove him to the area where Samantha lived. He waited in a transit van nearby as Moat approached the home. Moat sat outside the house listening to their conversations. He relayed his take on their conversations to Ness in a series of text messages, such as Getting bored waiting. They're all just slagging me off. My suffering is so funny, apparently. He wondered if he should shoot through an open window between 2.22 and 2.27am. He sent messages that said They have just opened the window, so I'm tempted to lean in, but I don't know if it will open or not. What do you reckon? Chance it or not? I'll make it to the car if I do. Within minutes, Chris and Samantha left the house. Raoul Moat was waiting for them. Chris stood in front of Samantha as she screamed out a warning. Moat loaded his shotgun and then fired. The first shot hit Christopher in the chest, but he was still standing. Samantha ran inside. Raoul Moat fired again, hitting Christopher in the neck, knocking him over. Moat then walked forward and shot him in the head at close range, killing him. Samantha watched from the window as her ex-boyfriend executed Chris. He then pointed the gun at her. 
he fired through the glass. Samantha had her arm up, passed through her left arm and into her abdomen where it did serious damage. Raoul Moat then ran from the area. Still carrying the shotgun in his arms, Ness drove the van to Biker in Newcastle where he ran his friend Querum Awan, who worked close by. A shotgun round pierced Samantha's arm, then hit her liver, stomach and pancreas. She sustained life-threatening injuries and surgeons at Queen's Elizabeth Hospital had to operate on her for eight hours. Raoul Moat wrote a letter, which was given to the Sun newspaper days later. It was a handwritten, 49-page document he had titled, quote, Raoul Moat Murder Statement, unquote. Excerpts from the letter said of the shooting, quote, Hid under neighbour's window and waited. For an hour and a half, I listened to them mocking me. It was hurtful listening to Sam, especially after six years. They had opened a window and I could hear everything. If I was ever going to back down, listening to them stopped that. At 2.30am, they came out. I shot him in the chest and he ran off. Sam screamed and tried to stop me as I gave chase. I fired the second and he went down. I pointed at Sam to chase her and she ran off. Phoned the police from the front door screaming. I reloaded two customised rounds, one for Sam, one for him. Sam's was half the powder, with small gauge pellets. With a superficial injury, she would get massive compensation payout for her and Chanel's future, inadvertently providing when I'm gone, and there would be small scarring, reminding her not to ever do this to anyone again. How could she have done this to me? I put the third round into his head and went to the window and fired at Sam, It hit, but she seemed okay, but I paused to be sure. She crawled to the kitchen quickly and hid behind the door. I looked around for anyone else to shoot. There was no one. Looked back at Sam, went to shoot myself, then changed my mind. I was terrified of losing Sam, as I knew I'd lose the plot on that, and not wanted to do so stopped me from ever beating her and anyone saying otherwise can go on a lie detector. Now I've realised Sam is really hurt and I'm gutted. I never meant that. Those doctors better save her or I'll hit the hospital. I still love her despite everything, but my head is in a mess right now and I know I'm too far gone to make much sense of it. I guess I've finally lost it. I'm not on the run. I will keep killing police until I'm dead. They've hunted me for years, now it's my turn. I am very sorry about Sam and I wish I hadn't shot her. Just make sure she stays alive. I never cheated on her. I wish she hadn't on me. She pulled the trigger by doing that just as much as me, unquote. After he had shot Samantha, Moat said he realised Carl was gone and he got a taxi and met up with Ness and Awan and, quote, went to ground, unquote. That Saturday afternoon, the police announced they were looking for a Raoul Moat. I would urge anybody who has any information about the incident or about the whereabouts of the offender to call the, the police immediately. He should not be approached. Moat didn't stay hidden for long. At first, police thought that the shooting was just a domestic murder. Threat assessments carried out by senior officers found that Moat posed a high risk to officers, but there was no indication at this time that he was actively hunting for them. When it emerged that he shot Chris Brown under the impression that he was a police officer, they warned armed police that he may be a threat. 42-year-old father of two, PC Rathband, the police officer who had seized Raoul Moat's car a year earlier was working in the Motor Patrol's department at Ethel Lane. As he arrived at work on Sunday 3rd of July, his work briefing didn't involve any discussion of Raoul Moat. But remembering the man from his interaction the previous year, PC Rathband raised the subject. He went with colleagues to look for the vehicle Moat was believed to have been travelling in, but they found nothing. He did not know that the gunman was now travelling in a black Lexus. He parked up on Denton Burn Roundabout, a busy area just north of the River Tyne. He joked with his wife that he was looking for a man with a gun. PC Rathband was looking for drunk drivers, not Raoul Moat. At 29 minutes past midnight, Raoul Moat made a 999 call. Here is a recording of that call. Hello there, this is the gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, My name is Raoul Moat. Um, what I'm phoning about is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done, right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back, 
but one of your officers, this gentleman that I shot last night, the crowd, the instructor, right? Been on to me, right, for years. He's a hassled this, harassed this, he has just won't leave us alone. I went straight six years ago when I met there, and I've tried my best to have a normal life, and you just won't let up, right? You won't leave us alone for five minutes. I can't drive down the street without the blue cracking lights, you know? You have stitched us up for years, you've been caught stitching us up. So the fact of the matter is, right, that she's had an affair with one of your officers. Once he's yep. a police officer, I wouldn't have shot him. Okay. The is that, right? But the thing is, you know, it's been going on, it's been going on for a while. I went to jail, right? Okay. I stitched up by you for, for hitting your kids, which I didn't do, right? right. I stitched right. up by you. I went to jail for something I didn't do. Now, I could have took a community order, right? Yeah, yeah. But... What happened is me and Sam had a discussion with me barrister. I went to jail, but in three to four weeks, the barrister promised us and let us down. She said she would have us on a retrial and get the not guilty, so me and my son would live together. Uh-huh. So I went to jail, right? No, I'm not going to minute, because you're losing me there, yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Well, I went to jail longer than I should have done for something I didn't do, right? But justify that in your own head. Yeah. Right? And meanwhile, while I'm doing that for my missus, she's having an affair with one of your officers, right? And then when I come out, right? So to wind him is up, saying that he's going to stick his up using him. Yeah. Right? And, you know, that he's this, he's that, he's going to, because he's a month of a fat bed, he's going to kick the right. all over the place. Okay, you know okay. I mean? mm-hmm. Right? And I've had nothing but grief from I've had a good relationship with her for six years, which is why we've stayed together. I've gone straight, I've had a total legitimate life with her, I've opened a business. Right, and right. And I've been shocked And you police have took too much off me over the years. You okay. won't take a load. Now you, now you think you can take your missus. Now, I didn't mean to shoot her like that, right? That okay, okay. Right? They deserved it, right? But she, right, uh, you, you can see from the ballistics, I've been altering those, those coverages, right? Mm-hmm. That one was only half the powder. It was only meant to get a compensation, because obviously I'm not going to be around in a few days, right? It was meant to just give her a little injury so she can get loads of compensation. Okay. And be, uh, yeah. bed. Now that photo just critical. I'm not happy about it. I didn't mean that. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't right, right. Me. I'm quite surprised she is critical. You know? But I didn't mean that. But the fact of the matter is, I'm not coming in a lie. You just hustled me for so many years. Hey, come anywhere near me and I'll kill you. I've got two hostages at the minute, right? Come anywhere near me and I'll kill them as well. I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I am coming to get you. You have made me unwell. You have made me do this because you just won't leave me out of jail. You just won't leave us alone. Can you, can you confirm you've got two hostages? I've got two, I've got two hostages, yes. Right. And, and where are you? I'm not going to tell you where I am. Okay, I'm fair enough. I'm yeah. Get those normally, right? yeah. I'm, can, I'm, I, I'm, can, I, can I just confirm who you are? Can you give me your date of birth, please? Yes, it's the 17th of June, 1973. Right, okay then. Thank you very much. Right. I am very sorry for what's happened with Sam. That's not what I meant. Right. You know? But I'll tell you something else. This other idiot in the paper that's saying I pointed the gun and you know, he's had to, like, you know, he, he starts to control him and all the rest of it. Yeah, and yeah. He, he was accused, right? I heard rumours in jail that he was sleeping on my son. The last okay, time, right, time, right. I saw the time start uh-huh. yesterday, and he said he heard the same rumours as well, but he didn't believe it was true, but he was definitely trying to get into it. So listen to me, but I'll tell you, he was the first one to run and hide upstairs, leaving his wife and leaving everybody else. You know what I mean? He didn't stand there and let it go and point at me, because I had a point at him, I would have shot him, because I do believe he was getting into it. There's been a lot of nonsense going on behind my back while I've been in jail. She's changed. She's not all changed. And every, every time I spoke to her and tried to be reasonable, she wouldn't let us anywhere near the bed. Right, she right. Off the house, she wouldn't discuss anything, and she was threatened for one of your officers. Yeah, yeah. Right? Now, I've had enough. I've had enough. I've, I've, I've jailed here so well, I've came up with different kids. You know what I mean? I've lost everything through you. Right? Just, just won't leave us alone, right? So, at the end of the day, you've killed me. You killed me and him before that trigger was ever pulled. Right. You know what I mean? You're okay. The first, we, you're the we, we, we are trying to help you, yeah. We're yeah. trying to help us. You know, you wanted me to do myself in, and I was going to do it until I found out about him properly and what was going on. And as soon as I found out, I thought, no, nah, you've had too much from me. You've had too much from me. You'll get your chance to kill us, right? You'll get your chance to kill us. No, okay. We, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. You, do, you, do, you don't want me to kill myself, but I'm going to give you a chance because I am going for officers now. Less than 10 minutes after the phone call ended, PC Rathband noticed someone running towards his vehicle. He recognised the person as Raoul Moat. Moat reached the window, pointed his shotgun against the glass and fired. PC Rathband was shot in the head. Still conscious but in extreme pain, he opened the door. Moat shot him again. This time the bullet pierced the officer's shoulder. To prevent himself from being shot again, he played dead after falling into the footwell of the car. In a display of extraordinary strength, PC David Rathband radioed for help, saying, 
I've been shot. The officer was then taken to Newcastle General Hospital in critical condition with injuries to his head and body. We just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, Real Paper. It wasn't that long ago that the great toilet paper hoarding fest began. Real is a bit different than the brands that people were stockpiling. They're better. Real is a bamboo toilet paper brand that does good and feels good. For every roll you buy, you are supporting the real mission to provide access to clean toilets to those in need. Every day, 2.4 billion people are without access to clean toilets. Meaning lost dignity, exposure to deadly pathogens, increased risk of contaminated water and loss of life. Supporting Real's mission to eliminate the threat of illness posed by a lack of access to toilets doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your comfort. You'll never run out of toilet paper again either. It's three-ply for extra softness, 100% natural and sustainable, helping to reduce your carbon footprint and the 27,000 trees cut down daily to make regular toilet paper. Real is made from tree-free, 100% bamboo paper. Zero plastic packaging, even the tape. Best of all, you can get it delivered to your door. All Real subscription orders include free shipping. Real is tree-free, bamboo toilet paper that does good and feels good. Use our coupon code CRIMELAPS to get 25% off your first order at realpaper.com. Raumo escaped and called 999 again less than an hour later. He believed the police weren't taking him seriously. In the letter obtained by the Sun newspaper, he said, quote, Last night I called 999 and declared war on Northumbria police before shooting an officer on the West End, A69 roundabout, in his T5. Sitting there waiting to bully someone. Probably a single mum who couldn't afford her car tax. Rang again and told them they're going to pay for what they've done to me and Sam. I went straight, but they couldn't let it go. The public need not fear me, but the police should, as I won't stop till I'm dead. They took it all from me. Kids, freedom, house, then Sam and Chanel. Where could I go from there? Obviously, I have issues, but I was pushed. I never beat my kids. I could simply admit to anything now, because it doesn't matter. I'm a killer and a maniac, but I ain't no coward. Unquote. The police addressed his second 999 call the next day, telling him they were taking him seriously. They read a statement written by Samantha with him to turn himself in for the sake of his children. We have received a lengthy written communication purporting to be from Mr Moat, which outlines in some detail a wide range of concerns that he has. This is one of a number of items of intelligence and information supplied and obtained from a range of sources which we are in the process of investigating. We have not received any direct contact from him. I want to reiterate my appeal made yesterday. Mr Moat, we are aware that you have a number of issues and grievances. Some are very private, others relate to how you feel that you've been treated by us. We want to understand your position and I want you to realise that you do have a future. We can only help you with this if you make contact with us directly. We've spoken to Sam and she has asked us to say the following to you. Please give yourself up. If you still love me and our baby, you would not be doing this anymore. Sam also said, when you came out of jail, I told you I was seeing a police officer. I said this because I was frightened. I have not been seeing a police officer. The next day, Raoul Moat delivers his handwritten letter to a friend's house. In the letter, he talks about his relationship with Samantha Stubbert and his mental state. Here are some excerpts originally published in The Sun. Quote, All my life I wanted death, hence the reason I took risks, made the worst kind of enemies and behaved the way I did. Shot at three times in my life yet didn't care, but now I had different thoughts. I wanted my life with Sam, someone who understood me and helped me be who I really wanted to be. Unquote. 
Conscious of the rising threat Mo posed to the police and the public, police launched raids with armed police officers in an attempt to find him. At a press conference that evening, the police tell the media that they believe Mo had kidnapped two men. We remain absolutely committed to finding Raoul Thomas Moat and are using every resource available to bring this to a conclusion as quickly as possible. This remains our primary objective, as does the safety of the public and my officers. We are currently undertaking a series of operational activities at various premises in the Northumbria Police area in connection with this inquiry. For obvious reasons, I am unable at this stage to say when, where or what that activity is. At 10.50pm that night, Moat held up a fish and chip shop near Blythe. He was still driving the black Lexus owned by Quirra Mawan. Moat, Ness and Awan had set up camp on the outskirts of Rothbury, a quiet village 26 miles north of Newcastle. The Lexus was found in an industrial estate the next day, July 6th. Ness and Awan were arrested shortly after, and Rothbury was locked down. The next day, July 7th, an appeal to Moat by Samantha Stobbert's dad was released by the police. Well, son, please, this has to stop. It's gone on far too long. What sort of memories are these of the kids that have of their father? If they ask me in the future, the bairns, I will tell them exactly what's happened. I won't lie to them, you know that. And I don't want to have to tell them that might upset them about you or, or whatever's gone on. How will someone give it up? In a press conference that day, the police said they believe Raoul Moat was still on the run, likely hiding in the countryside near Rothbury. They had found a tent used by Moat with a letter inside addressed to Samantha Stobbert. A media blackout was in place, banning personal details about Moat from being published. Moat had been incensed by the coverage and threatened to kill a civilian every time there was something false printed about him. The hunt for Raoul Moat was enormous. 500 officers, including 160 armed officers, were deployed, 100 from Northumbria Police, 40 from London Met, and 20 from seven other police departments. There were eight armed response vehicles, sniper teams, ten armoured 4x4s and even an RAF plane fitted with infrared for overnight reconnaissance. We still believe Mr Moat's main grievances are against the police. However, more recent information received indicates Mr Moat may now pose a threat to the wider public. We still believe Mr Moat to be in the Rothbury area, although inquiries are ongoing throughout the force area. Moat had been on the run for almost a week. Many believe he was able to evade capture by using a storm drain that ran beneath the village. He used this to get around. He was found by police just after 7pm on Friday 9th of July, on the riverside, very close to the drain entrance. A six-hour standoff began in torrential rain. When cornered by police, he told them to shoot him and put the gun under his chin. At a later inquest, the first officer at the scene recalled shouting, Armed police, drop your weapon. Moat replied, Shoot me, fucking shoot me. Hearing the officer's West Yorkshire accents calmed him. These weren't the Northumbria police he passionately hated for years. They spoke with Moat for less than a half an hour before train negotiators took over. As they tried to keep Moat calm, the village of Rothbury was frenzied. Officers racing to the scene crashed into each other. The roads were locked down and locals were warned to stay indoors. A local man told CNN that his wife's bell ringing practice was shut down after the police came, quote, banging on the door and yelling, stop the bells, we're trying to negotiate, unquote. Moat was on his knees by the river, his shotgun under his chin, his eyes fixed on the surrounding police. To add to the already incredibly dramatic narrative of the standoff, football legend Paul Gascoigne showed up at Rathbury. He got out of a taxi in his dressing gown, offering to help with negotiations. He later told local Metro Radio that he wanted to, quote, give him some therapy and just say, come on, Modi, it's Gaza, unquote. He offered to bring chicken and lager. His offer was politely refused and he was asked to step away. Negotiators pleaded with Moat to give up, offering him a hot shower and tea. Moat revealed while he was hiding out he had taken to eating dead mice to feed himself. 
Food and water were brought to the riverside as well as Moat's best friend, Tony Laidler. Witnesses nearby remember a tired and scruffy-looking Raoul Moat shouting and seeming agitated as over a dozen officers trained their sights on him. Efforts made over five hours of negotiations were futile. The officers had achieved partial harmony between themselves and the man who vowed to kill as many officers as he could. The hunter was cornered. Moat spoke of having no one who cared about him. The rain had soaked his clothes and he was shivering. He told the negotiator, quote, Tell the kids I love them. Tell Sam I'm sorry, unquote. Police knew what was coming next. Specialist officers were creeping up behind him in an attempt to disarm him. Mo had said, quote, I haven't even got a dad, unquote. He moved the gun from under his chin to his right temple. Police fired a taser from a high-powered gun, but it didn't deliver an electric charge. At around 1.15am, Raoul Mo shot himself in the head. The Sun newspaper later quoted the negotiator present as saying the following. My colleagues were shouting, Raoul, put the gun down. Raoul, don't do it. Don't do it. Think of your kids. But he didn't listen. At that point, there was a pop and the firearm moved several inches from his head. He made a scream. He shouted ow loudly, then pushed the gun back against his temple. There was a second pop and a diamond-shaped flash, and that's when he shot the side of his head off and there was an exit from the side of his head. And then he fell over. And that was the end. Unquote. Moat was rushed to Newcastle General Hospital by ambulance. Incredibly, despite his catastrophic injuries, his heart continued to beat. He was pronounced dead at 2.20am. Adrian Tempany of the Financial Times said in an article that a, quote, delusional sense of power, unquote, appeared to have afflicted Raoul Moat. He would control Samantha, his friends, his children, his appearance... Moat recorded over 50 hours of tape in less than a year. These recordings documented normal conversations with family and friends and meetings with social workers and police force. ICV aired short clips of the audio. In the audio, he asks social workers to arrange a psychiatrist appointment for him. Whether this was a genuine plea for help or a manipulating statement to make him seem like he was willing to do anything to better himself is unsure. Raoul Moat definitely displayed a lot of traits seen in both narcissistic and paranoid personalities. In an article on psychologytoday.com, Joe Navarro combined these traits in a list. Here are some you could expect to see in a paranoid narcissist that we can clearly see in Raoul Moat. A lack of empathy and inability to recognise the needs or suffering of others, but still expects endless sympathy and support. A tendency to see his problems as unique or more acute than others. Very thin-skinned. Constantly looks for and ruminates on social slights and grievances that he never forgets. Unwilling to acknowledge his own mistakes, wrongdoings or perilous actions. Sees himself as a victim. Believes there is a conspiracy against him. David Wilson, a professor of criminology at Birmingham City University, said in a BBC article that he thought Raoul Moat's actions were all about power and control. This is typical of a paranoid narcissist. He said Moat used a, quote, technique of neutralisation, unquote, where he would try to downplay and justify his acts of violence by insinuating someone knowingly drove him to do it. The police knew this about Raoul Moat. They were very careful in the press conference not to insult him, even praising his outdoor survival skills. Maybe if he had gotten psychiatric help, he wouldn't have ruined so many lives. Raoul Moat was both commemorated and condemned. Shrouds were built at his home and people would stop their cars in Rothbury to take photos of the spot he died. Raoul Moat was trending on Twitter and Facebook pages were set up in remembrance. He had become an anti-hero. At one stage, a memorial page on Facebook had over 36,000 members. David Cameron made the following remarks at Prime Minister's Question Time. Uh, As far as I can see, it is absolutely clear that Raoul Moat was a callous murderer. Full stop, end of story, and I cannot understand any wave, however small, of public sympathy for this man. There should be sympathy for his victims, and for the havoc he wreaked in that community, there should be no sympathy for him. There was an inquest into the death of Raoul Moat and the use of tasers, which had only been licensed for testing in the UK. 
the experimental X-12 taser was shot just before he shot himself in the head. There was no evidence found of police misconduct, but it was controversial. The jurors of the inquest returned a verdict of suicide. Raoul Mote always had a leader mentality. Carl Ness, his friend, supplied him with the gun, drove him to the house in Berkeley where he shot Chris Brown and Samantha Stobart, and later aided his evasion of the police. Ness was charged with the murder of Chris Brown, the attempted murder of PC Rathband, conspiracy to murder, and two counts of possession of a firearm with intent to endanger life and rob a shop. He lied in court, saying he was a hostage and that Mote had threatened his girlfriend's life if he didn't do as he was told. He received a sentence of 40 years to life in March 2011. Cora Wan was charged with conspiracy to murder, attempted murder and robbery. He had been driving on the night Raoul Moat rang 999 and declared he was hunting officers. He helped Moat evade capture and even went shopping for supplies for him. He was sentenced to two life sentences and must serve a minimum of 20 years. In the public gallery sat PC Rathband. The police officer Raoul Moat had shot in the face after declaring war on the police. Amazingly, PC Rathband had survived the brutal shooting, but he lost his sight. He was in significant pain daily. He set up a charity called the Blue Lamp Foundation, which supports and raises money for emergency service personnel injured in the line of duty. He struggled to cope with his disability and his marriage broke down. He was found at his home in Blythe, Northumberland, on February 29, 2012. He had hung himself. PC Rathband made a claim against Northumbria police before he took his own life. That action was continued by his siblings on his children's behalf. They claimed that the police had a duty of care to inform PC Rathband of the threats made by Moat on the night he was shot. The evidence showed there were less than 10 minutes between the conclusion of Rail Moat's 999 call and the shooting of PC Rathband. The claim was dismissed because there simply wasn't enough time to warn officers before PC Rathband was shot. An inquest into the death of Christopher Brown was held in December 2013. The coroner, Terence Carney, ruled the death an unlawful killing. He spoke about the information Durham Prison had passed to Northumbria Police about Moat's threats to harm Samantha and said the exact risk was not known. Mr Carney also spoke highly of Christopher Brown's mother, Sally. Sally had been acutely aware of the lack of coverage her son had gotten in the media circus surrounding Raoul Moat and challenged the court not to forget her son. He will not be forgotten. Christopher Brown was brought up in Windsor and Slough. His mother described him as, quote, happy-go-lucky, unquote. He was well-liked and worked as a karate instructor for years. He'd moved to Newcastle for work. Hundreds attended his funeral in Slough. Mourners wore the colour of his favourite football team, Chelsea. He had two children, Charlie was 11 and Jimmy was almost seven. Raoul Moat's rampage and the manhunt that followed will be remembered for years. But it is his victims who should be the ones who don't fade from memory. Christopher Brown died because a lie about his occupation injured Moat's fragile ego. Samantha Stubbert was shot because she dared to try and move on. PC Rathbund was blinded and subsequently took his own life. One of the last things Raoul Moat said before he killed himself was that he didn't have a father. Because of him, there are three sets of children who will grow up without theirs. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've liked what you heard, please leave us a review or some feedback. You can support us by listening to the show, leaving reviews or join us on Patreon. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks' time. Hey guys, this is Julia from Always Time for True Crime. Every week, I get into a new case about murder, missing persons, and serial killers. My podcast is all about the lesser known cases. So, if you're looking for something beyond Ted Bundy or John Bonet Ramsey, head on over to Always Time for True Crime for some new true crime stories. You can listen to Always Time for True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, Stitcher, and more.